Welcome back to Biomechanics. Today's lecture is on the structure and mechanical testing of bone. Bone is a hard connective tissue. This means that infinitesimal strain and linear elasticity are appropriate approximations. Bone mechanics is therefore a very well established branch of biomechanics. Particular aspects of bone mechanics that are frequently studied include failure and healing of bone, remodeling and growth of bone, optimal design and functional adaptation of bone, prostheses for repair and replacement, and the microstructural basis of bone mechanical properties. Here is a typical long bone in which we see some of the major features. The diaphysis or shaft is the central region of the bone. It's a hollow tube of dense cortical compact bone. The central medullary cavity contains the bone marrow. The outer surface is the periosteum and the inner surface is the endosteum. The expansions at the end of long bone are called the metaphyses and the end of the expansions are called the epiphyses. During development the bone starts out as cartilage and calcifies at this epiphyseal line or growth plate so that the bone calcifies outwards from the, from the middle. When the bone is mature the only cartilage that's left is the articular cartilage that forms the low friction bearing surface at the joints. Long bone consists of different types and compartments. There's the compact cortical bone, which is the dense outer layer of the whole bone. There are different types of cortical bone, including woven bone in skeletally immature bones, laminar bone, which replaces woven bone after skeletal maturity or after an injury. There's haversion bone, which is formed by vascularization of the woven bone. There's also trabecular or cancellous bone. It's found in the epiphyses, uh, in the metaphysis, and on the inner surface at the endosteum of the diaphysis. In contrast to the compact bone, it has this spongy structure. The elements of this spongy structure are called trabeculi, and the trabecular surface area is about 20 times greater than the periosteal surface area. The periosteum is the outer layer of the bone, and it surrounds the entire bone except for the articulating surfaces where the cartilage is. It has an osteogenic inner layer where bone grows and a fibrous outer layer to protect the bone. The majority of mature cortical bone is haversion bone consisting of hollow structures called osteons. An artery and or a vein runs through the center of the osteon via what's known as the haversion canals. There are also transversely connecting or perforating canals known as the Volkmann's canals. The lamellae or layers that form the lamella and haversion bone consist of spiral wound collagen fibers embedded with mineral crystals. There are also osteocytes, bone cells. They are the long-lived cells that maintain mature bone and they are embedded in voids in the bone called lacunae with their cell processes emanating out from the cell body in structures in the bone called canaliculi. Cartilage consists of a connective tissue matrix primarily comprised of type 2 collagen, cartilage cells which are called chondrocytes, the fetal skeleton is cartilaginous, a dense cellular cartilage, and only specialized cartilage subtypes remain in adults. 
These include hyalin or glassy cartilage that's found in the articulating joints, as well as the costal, that's the ribs, nasal, nose, or tracheobronchial tissues. Then there's white fibrocartilage, which is found in the intervertebral discs and is higher in collagen. And yellow elastic fibrocartilage found in specialized structures such as the ears, larynx, and epiglottis, and are particularly rich in elastin fibers. The coefficient of friction, defined as the ratio of the shear stress to the normal stress at a lubricated surface, is very low in articular cartilage, especially in the presence of synovial fluid as the lubricating layer. And some measurements have it as low as 0 0.002 for modest loads such as 500 kilopascals. Bone is a composite material. About a third of the volume is organic, consisting primarily of the extracellular collagen fiber matrix running in the lamellae, which is impregnated with about another third by volume of a dense inorganic calcium phosphate crystals known as hydroxyapatite. And then the remaining third is water. The cells in bone are called osteoblasts, the cells that generate new bone, and osteoclasts, the cells that degrade it. Different species have different fractions of water, mineral, and organic content. For example, fish have a higher fraction of water and a lower fraction of mineral content, giving rise to a lower specific gravity. Uh, in contrast, a human bone has a lower water fraction and a higher mineral fraction, uh, but cow bone is even higher, and you can see rat is actually nearly 50% mineral content. And these correspond to differences in the density and mechanical properties of the bone between these different species. Bone is therefore a composite of collagen fibers and hydroxyapatite crystals. Two thirds of the dry weight, about 50% of the volume, is the hydroxyapatite mineral crystals. The Young's modulus of hydroxyapatite is approximately 165 gigapascals which is similar to that of steel, about 200 gigapascals. However, hydroxyapatite is very brittle, so it's not as strong as steel. Collagen is non-linear and can undergo relatively high strains, but even at high load, you can see its Young's modulus is only one hundredth that of hydroxyapatite. The Young's modulus of the bone composite is in between that of the hydroxyapatite mineral crystals and the organic collagen fibers and is about 18 gigapascals. However, however, the strength of bone is greater than that of either of its main constituents. The soft collagen prevents hydroxyapatite from undergoing early brittle fracture, whereas the stiff hydroxyapatite prevents the collagen from yielding. Composite properties depend not only on the composition, but also on the structure and bonding between the components. Bone density increases with mineral content and has been correlated, at least in part, with bone strength. However, there are other determinants of the strength of the bone than merely the density. Bone material can be tested ex vivo, uh, but there are many considerations involved in bone testing. Firstly, the properties of the bone change during storage. For example, drying affects its composition because bone is a third or more water and therefore affects its mechanical properties. Common storage methods to avoid changes in mechanical properties include storing the bone in saline, but that can only be done relatively briefly, or in a mixture of saline and alcohol. Or, freezing in a plastic bag after wrapping the bone in moist gauze and leaving uh, muscle tissues on can help prolong the life and the mechanical properties of the bone for testing. Embalming or fixation of bone tissue significantly changes its mechanical properties.
The density of bone is measured typically after fat and oil are removed by boiling the bone. It can also be estimated by radiographic densitometry because more dense materials absorb more x-rays. The material of trabecular and cortical bone is about the same in density, about 1.85 to 2 grams per centimeter cubed. However, the apparent density of trabecular bone, including the voids between the trabeculi, is much lower, only 0.15 to 1 gram per centimeter cubed because the trabecular bone is so spongy. The mineral content can be measured by measuring the ash weight divided by the dry weight. The ash weight is the weight of the bone after it's been burned at 700 degrees Celsius, and the dry weight is the weight of the bone after it's been dried at 60 degrees Celsius for seven days. Uniaxial tensile testing is usually done on standardized test specimens like this that are machined from samples of bone. Here, L is called the gauge length. This is the portion of the specimen where the strain is measured. The wider portions are used to attach the sample to the test device. Studies show that the stress-strain curve depends somewhat on the strain rate, in other words, how fast the load is applied. Other testing methods include three-point bending, uniaxial compression, and torsion or shear testing. Ultrasonic methods are also used to measure bone mechanical properties because the speed of transverse wave propagation through bone depends on the shear modulus of the bone. So this curve shows a typical stress-strain relation measured for human long bone. You can see that for strains less than 0.5%, the stress-strain relation is linear. But at some point after this, the relation becomes non-linear, the bone starts to yield and fracture, ultimately failing. The strength of bone is often measured as the ultimate tensile stress, about 140 megapascals in this case, and the ultimate tensile strain, about 1.5%. However, in between this ultimate failure point and the linear portion of the curve, there is a nonlinear region during which damage can occur to the bone. It's not easy to tell from the stress-strain curve whereabouts that yield point is. And so for bone, as in many other materials, engineers often use a convention called the 0.2% offset yield as a way of estimating the yield point. The way this is done is that a straight line parallel to the linear portion of the curve is drawn with an offset of 0.2% on the strain axis. Where that curve intersects the stress-strain curve defines the yield point. And in this experiment, you can see that the yield stress was 121 megapascals and the yield strain was 0.0084, in other words, 0.84%. So you can see even below 1% strain, damage occurs, and not much above 1% strain, ultimate failure occurs. However, below 0.5% strain, the stress-strain relationship of bone is linear, and the slope of the stress-strain relation, uh, which is the Young's modulus for long bone, is about 18 or 19 gigapascals. The Young's modulus and the failure properties of bone depend on the strain rate, how quickly the strain is applied. You can see that as the strain rate is increased from in this test 0.001 per second to in this test 1500 per second, so about six orders of magnitude change in strain rate, that the Young's modulus gets higher with the strain rate uh, and the ultimate stress and strain and yield points change. However, it's also worth recognizing that this is a very wide range of strain rate, a million-fold change in strain rate, for what amounts to about less than a two-fold change in Young's modulus. So while bone is sensitive to strain rate, it's only sensitive to relatively large variations in strain rate. For example, the difference between the strain rates that the bone might experience while you're sleeping or sitting versus the strain rate that might be experienced when a bullet strikes it or in a high-speed accident. 
There's an empirical formula called the Ramberg-Osgood equation that relates the stress and the strain and the strain rate and has been used for bone. So rearranging this equation where the strain is equal to the stress divided by a constant times the strain rate to a power, we get that the Young's modulus T over epsilon must be proportional to the strain rate to the power of D. It's been reported that D is in the range of 0.018 to 0.057 in different bone tissues. So using this for the range of strain rates that would normally occur suggests that the Young's modulus E would only vary about 15% under the normal range of strain weights that would occur during normal activity. So for this reason, most of the time, the effects of strain rate on bone Young's modulus uh, are ignored unless conditions of extreme strain rate are encountered. So let's look at some common mechanical properties of bone. For adult human femoral compact bone, the stress-strain behavior of bone when it's dry is linear to failure at a uniaxial strain of 0.4%. In other words, drying out the bone compared with the previous stress-strain relation we just looked at causes the bone to fail lower down the curve and essentially to make the bone more brittle. Failure in wet bone occurs, as we saw, at around 1.2 to 1.5% and the curve becomes non-linear at about 0.4 to 0.5%. These properties vary with age, the type of loading, the strain rate as we saw, and the testing conditions and environment. So some elastic properties that have been measured for adult human femoral compact bone include the modulus elasticity of 17.6 gigapascals, very similar to our previous example. The modulus elasticity in compression, however, is somewhat lower, only about 4.9 gigapascals. In shear, the modulus is called G, and using torsional testing, the shear modulus of adult human femoral compact bone has been measured at about 3.2 gigapascals, so even lower again. So those were elastic properties, those were stress-strain properties under loading conditions that do not cause damage. Strength properties are properties that are measured under failure load conditions. So the ultimate tensile stress of adult long bone is approximately 124 megapascals. And the ultimate tensile strain for human femoral compact bone is about 1.4%. Even though the compressive Young's modulus was actually lower than the tensile Young's modulus, the ultimate compressive strength is actually slightly higher than the ultimate tensile strength in long bone. In other words, the strain at which ultimate failure occurs in compression is somewhat higher in compression than in tension. In fact, the ultimate percentage contraction the amount by which the bone compresses before it fails is 1.85%. The ultimate bending strength is actually in between the ultimate compressive strength and the ultimate tensile strength, which makes sense because bending involves both tension and compression and is about 160 megapascals. And the ultimate torsional shear strength, like the torsional stiffness, is lower than the tensile strength, only 54 megapascals. These measurements were all for dense cortical region of the diaphysis of long bone. The same quantity is measured for the spongy cancellous or trabecular bone is significantly lower. By comparison, let's look at some other materials where we show here the Young's modulus and the shear modulus, which are elastic properties, and the ultimate tensile stress, which is a strength failure property. So elastin, for example, has a Young's modulus of only 600 kilopascals compared with collagen, which is one gigapascal, so over a thousand times higher. Rubber is in between about 1.4 megapascals, whereas steel is two orders of magnitude higher than collagen at 200 gigapascals. Comparison, alumina alloys and glass are 50 and 75 gigapascals. The ultimate tensile stress of collagen is 50 to 100 megapascals, and of steel is about 1,000 gigapascals. And here we see the shear moduli for steel and aluminum alloys of 80 and 25 gigapascals. So the strength and stiffness of metals is higher than that of bone. So the factors that determine the strength of bone 
are a highly studied aspect of bone mechanics. The strength and fracture of bone depend on the specimen preparation, as we've described, whether it's wet, dry, or embalmed. The orientation of testing, whether it's axial to the long bone or transverse to the axis of the long bone. Which region is tested? For example, axial strength is highest at the mid-diaphysis at the middle shaft. The transverse strength is highest at the ends, at the epiphyses. Age is an important factor. Bone strength tends to decrease significantly with age. And the type of bone also determines the bone strength. The strength of herversion bone is about 30% less than that of lamella bone. The type of loading also matters, as we've seen. So the tensile strength of long bone is about 132 megapascals in the longitudinal direction versus 58 in the transverse direction. The compressive strength is about 187 megapascals in the longitudinal direction and 132 transversely. And the shear strength is about 67 megapascals. The way bone fails also depends on the loading conditions. Under axial tension, the failure surface is fairly perpendicular to the load at high strain rates. However, at low strain rates, the failure surface is rougher and this is because the osteons are pulled apart and so you get a, a rough failure surface. Under compression, the fracture plane is typically about 60 degrees to the load axis. Now, fracture is studied by measuring or estimating the energy needed to propagate small cracks. The mineralization of bone has a significant effect on its strength. For example, comparing deer antler, which has a lower density than cow femur of 1.86 grams per centimeter cubed compared with 2.06 grams per centimeter cubed, You'll see that it has a lower mineral content, a lower Young's modulus, but a higher fracture work than the cow femur. And that's because even though it's less stiff because it has less mineral, it's also less brittle because it has more collagen. Let's summarize the key points we've learned about bone structure and mechanics today. Bone is a hard tissue and can be approximated as linearly elastic under working conditions. The shaft or diaphysis of long bone consists of compact cortical bone. The epiphyses at the ends of long bone contain spongy trabecular or cancellous bone and are capped with articular cartilage at the joints. The basic unit of compact bone is the osteon, which forms the haversion canal system. Bone is a composite of water, hydroxyapatite mineral, and collagen protein. A typical long bone under standard uniaxial testing has an elastic modulus of approximately 18 gigapascals, an ultimate tensile stress of approximately 140 megapascals, an ultimate tensile strain of approximately 1.5%, and a yield strain of approximately 0.08%. Trabecular bone is less stiff, less dense, and less strong. Bone strength and stiffness vary significantly with density, mineral content, and structure as well as age, species, and type of loading. So next time we'll talk about elasticity and its application to bone mechanics.